Hello and welcome to this episode of Catholic Lives. Today's Catholic life we're looking at is the life of Constantine XI Palilogos, the last emperor of the Romans. If you don't know, the Roman Empire lasted beyond the ancient world because when Rome and the West fell, the Roman, uh, Roman part of the empire in the eastern part of the empire centered on Constantinople, lasted for another thousand years, more than a thousand years. And in fact, uh, became what we know in the West as the Byzantine Empire. And it was conquered uh, in 1453. In fact, it was conquered on May 29th, the day I'm recording this episode. And so this is the uh, May 29th of 1453. So this is the 566th anniversary of the fall of Constantinople. And the last Byzantine emperor, the last emperor of the Roman Empire, stretching back to Constantine the Great, was Constantine the Eleventh. Uh, the irony, not lost on historians, that the first and last emperor, uh, their names were both Constantine. And so who was he? Well, he was a member of the Paleologo, Paleologos dynasty, Paleologan dynasty, which came to the throne in the 1260s after, if you recall, in the Fourth Crusade in 1204, the uh, Byzantine Empire had been sacked and conquered by Western Crusaders, uh, which they should not have done. Uh, eventually it was retaken again by the Paleologo family, and he, he was a member of this family, which uh, oversaw, if you like, the decline of the empire with the sack of Constantinople in 1204. Uh, there was a precipitous decline from the 13th century onward. In the 1330s, the Ottoman Turks who were the rising power in that area of the world in Asia Minor, began to uh, gain a foothold in Europe, eventually uh, swallowing up uh, most of the former Byzantine lands. In fact, when he comes to the throne in 1449, uh, when his brother John VIII dies, basically only the city of Constantinople is still left, still standing. And the um, Paleologo family, Paleologo's family, had made efforts to try to keep the empire alive. They had appealed for Western aid for several decades before he became emperor. His father, Emmanuel II, went on a tour of Western Europe, went to France, went to England, trying to get aid against the Ottoman Turks. Uh, Western kingdoms, by the way, were never terribly, terribly inclined to do so. They had their own wars while they were fighting, and there was still mutual suspicion between East and West. Oh, they did, as we'll see in a moment, uh, sponsor a crusade at one point on their behalf. And in fact, his brother, John VIII, uh, in 1439, had gone to Italy uh, with a retinue of bishops from the Orthodox Church uh, in Constantinople to Florence, to the Council of Florence, Ferrara, in which, at least at this council, you had a reunion between the Eastern and Western churches, the Council of Florence. Uh, they signed an agreement. Basically, every member, including the emperor, um, swore their loyalty to the pope, uh, came back into communion with Rome, except for one person. And they overcame, at least at that meeting, their theological disagreements. Unfortunately, as soon as John VIII and his entourage arrived back in Constantinople, virtually everybody involved in it, except for him and a couple other people, repudiated, <laughs> repudiated the Council of Florence. And so it didn't stick, as it were. But the council was done. The whole reason to do this for the Byzantines, mostly, was to gain Western aid against the advancing Ottomans. And in fact, the Pope uh, in the 1430s, Eugenius IV, the one who'd called the Council of Florence, did actually manage to um, convince Western knights to fight a crusade. Uh, so they sent an army into the Balkans, and in the Battle of Varna in 1449, this crusade was wiped out uh, by the Ottoman forces, and so it didn't work, unfortunately. And so when he comes to the throne in 1453, it's a very desperate situation, is it, for Constantine? But he was ready for it in many ways. He was actually a soldier. Uh, he'd spent his life, most of his life in Greece, in Mistras, which was a city they ruled from. Uh, he was a soldier by training. He actually reconquered parts of Greece from uh, Western Frankish rulers from France, essentially, and uh, had made his name this way. This is unlike his brother, by the way, John VIII, the previous emperor, who'd been more artistically and theologically inclined. And in fact, by the way, if you go to Florence today, you go to the Medici Chapel, because the Medici family was running Florence at the time, there's a marvelous painting by Benozzo Gozzoli of the three wise men, the three magi, and we figured out that the three magi, the, the 
the figures that they're based on are actually based on uh, one of them is actually based on uh, the Emperor John the Eighth from Constantinople, so you can see the influence of this there. But by the time he comes to the throne in 1449, he's in a desperate way. He also uh, comes back into communion Rome with, with Rome. Um, he um, keeps the deal basically that his brother made with uh, with the Roman Church. I don't know how much uh, I've read a lot about Constantine Constantine the Eleventh. In fact. It's not really clear how much he actually believed this and how much he just wanted the Western aid. Uh, my own take on this is that he was a soldier. I don't think he really cared much about theological niceties. All he knew was that the Western Westerners were Christians and they were willing to help, essentially. Uh, particularly the the uh, one major ally that could have helped them, could have helped um, Constantinople survive independently, might have been the Venetians. The city state of Venice by this time was still one of the great naval powers in the Mediterranean world. They had the only navy that could probably actually help them fight off the Byzantines, but excuse me, fight off the uh, Turks. But if you don't know anything about the relationship between the Byzantine Empire and the Venetians, it was very strained. Um, there were actually uh, several thousand Venetians, but also Genoese living, had living, living in Constantinople for a long, long time. Uh, and so he appealed to aid uh, uh, from these Western allies. Uh, as you're going to see, it didn't. it came too late. Because by 1452, the uh, Turkish sultan, Mehmed II, had made clear his intentions to take the city. He wanted to make a name for himself by swallowing what was left of the Byzantine Empire. And so in 1453, he sent, uh, early 1453, he sent an army of 150,000 people to march on Constantinople, besiege the city. Constantine, along with some 8,000 uh, men, mostly uh, native Greek-speaking, well, they didn't call themselves Byzantines, they called themselves Roma, Romans, but also Venetians and Genoese, held off this massive army for a better part of two months. Until, uh, in late May, they began to actually breach the city walls. If you don't know, this is one of the first major, major victories scored in military history in which cannon made a big impact. The walls of Constantinople had stood for over a thousand years, they had beaten off attacks from Arabs, from Slavs, from all different sorts of invaders throughout its history. But with the uh, the Mehmed II actually had, of all people, a Hungarian engineer uh, make a couple of gigantic cannons for uh, his army, and they began to pound away at the walls, and we were already beginning to reduce them to rubble by late May. And so the game was uh, finally up. And so the night before uh, the final battle, which they, he must have known they were going to lose, there's a couple different versions of this floating around. You can actually find some of this stuff on the internet. He gave, he assembled all the people, all the troops he could, basically, did Constantine. He gave a famous speech in some versions of this. He talks about the, uh, talks about the Byzantines being descended from the great Roman emperors, being descended from the ancient Greeks, about them being a noble people. He makes appeals to the Christian, common Christian heritage of both uh, uh, his own people, but also the Genoese and the Venetians in the city. Uh, the most uh, reliable version comes from a man named Leonard of Chios, who was actually in the city before it fell, when it fell, I should say. And just to read you the last lines of this, he uh, said as he's just addressed uh, the men of uh, Italy, of Genoa and Venice, and the last words he gives to his troops before uh, they go into battle in the mor late mor early morning the next day is, I'm quoting here, You, my comrades in arms, obey the commands of your leaders in the knowledge that this is the day of your glory, a day on which, if you shed but a drop of blood, you will win for yourselves crowns of martyrdom and eternal fame. Unquote. The great um, 18th century uh, historian Edward Gibbon referred to this speech as the quote-unquote funeral oration of the Roman Empire, so the last hurrah for that ancient institution. Uh, it said that uh, after this was done, Constantine went up to every one of the men present and shook their hands and asked them to forgive him if he uh, wronged them in any way. Then everyone basically went, did a procession into the Hagia Sophia, the great cathedral in Constantinople, uh, took communion for one last time, and then went to man their positions. And then in the early hours of the morning, uh, at some point during the fighting, he um, stripped off his armor, waded into the battle, and disappeared. 
And there's real disputes about what actually happened to him in terms of his body, never where they found his resting place. It seems that uh, the Turks did identify him at some point, probably. Uh, they needed to in order to make sure he wasn't alive. And probably was buried in a common grave with the rest of his soldiers, which was um, probably the best way um, for him to be buried. However, uh, from the time uh, the city fell, um, legends began to spring up about Constantine XI. Um, the idea was that he had somehow, the legend grew up that he had somehow sort of uh, managed to sort of escape or more magically to sort of um, seal himself within the marble walls of the Hagia Sophia or in some versions uh, the, the palace there and was waiting uh, to retake the city to come back again and sometimes in their you know um, Greek folklore Greek poetry is sometimes referred to as the marble emperor or the immortal emperor because he's supposed to come back and retake the city itself later on in the 19th century, when the um, the Greeks regained their independence in the 1830s during a, a war of independence that was supported by Western powers, um, uh, he became a sort of national figure, a national hero. In fact, if you go today to the Athenian parliament uh, in Athens, you will see a statue of the right-believing emperor Constantine XI, the ethnomartyr. Uh, you see him carrying a. Uh, you see him, you know, standing up with his sword in hand, the double eagle seal of the uh, Byzantine Empire behind him. And uh, ethnobarner, by the way, means uh, national martyr, mar martyr for a Christian people. And in fact, to this day, Constantine is venerated as a saint by both the Orthodox, but also by Byzantine Christians in communion with Rome. Uh, there's no formal canonization process for any of the Eastern churches. There's none of that stuff. It's just by popular acclaim. Uh, he is known as a as a saint because he was a martyr for his people, and so you have this you know uh, brilliant life uh, of this interesting family uh, cut short, um, but died nobly defending you know what was left of his heritage and his uh, inheritance, and so this day remember uh, the the, uh, the immortal emperor Constantine the eleventh, the last emperor of the Romans on this day, May 29th. Hope you've enjoyed this brief Catholic life. Uh, if you like our uh, podcast, please give a like, subscribe, spread the word, share, uh, let people know about it. Uh, hopefully it uh, uh, was enlightening for you. I always enjoy doing it. Hope you guys have a great rest of the week. Thank you, take care, and God bless.